So this is a, a project that predates the International Innovation Course. Actually, I think of it as the precursor, because if I weren't doing this, uh, I would never have started the International Innovation Corps. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm happy to, to take Q&A on that later, but uh, I'm gonna focus on the health insurance experiment since that's the uh, um, main purpose of today's talk. Okay, so I wanna tell you a little bit about a study that we're doing, that's the International Health uh, Insurance, uh, the Indian Health Insurance Experiment, but in order to do so, I think we need to tell you a little bit of background, a very kind of superficial background on the Indian healthcare system. Uh, so, and, and uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the I'm, I'm not looking at a day-to-day -day perspective or a year-to-year -year perspective on what's going on in India. I'm thinking about a decade-to-decade -decade perspective on what's going on in India, because uh, that's kind of the horizon that we're thinking about when we think about uh, health care uh, and health um, more generally in India. And so here's the kind of the salient story that, you, you know, when you go to India, uh, this, this is what you see, all right? If you study, you know, recent uh, last few decades of Indian history, you'll see that India's had a dramatic increase in, in its economic growth uh, rate. Uh, you know, depending on your perspective, it either starts in the late 80s or it starts uh, in the uh, uh, early to mid 1990s. Um, and everybody's really excited about that. Indians are very proud of that. Uh, but one of the challenges uh, with that is that it really hasn't trickled down to everybody. Uh, and it hasn't really trickled down to health, uh, especially at the bottom of the pyramid. And so you have, you know, uh, look at health statistics pre and post the massive change and they don't look all that great. So you get statistics like infant mortality rates that are uh, 47 out of 1,000 uh, births, maternal mortality rates, tw 200 out of 100,000 births. And so that puts you in the bottom quartile uh, of all countries in the world. Uh, despite the fact that India is one of the, you know, the top five, top, is it top five now economies in the world. Um, and so that's, that's, that's problematic. Um, you know, part of the problem for why health is, is so poor, now, of course, you know, I, I, as a health economist, I always want to separate health from health care. Health care does not guarantee health uh, and sometimes hinders health. Uh, and there are a lot of non-health care related interventions you can do to impact health and they're much more productive. Example, smoking in the United States, right? But, but be that as it may, you know, one of the things that we think is, especially for countries uh, where there's less intense, on average, healthcare intervention, that healthcare can be positive, can be a helpful thing. Well, the problem that India has partly is a supply issue, which is it doesn't have a lot of healthcare supply. It doesn't have a lot of clinics and hospitals. Uh, and so the statistics that kind of capture that for me uh, is, you know, the one that I like is this one from the Dr. Mukherjee Sood paper which is basically nearly a half of children live in villages with no healthcare facility at all, right? Which is a sh shocking, uh, uh, shockingly low amount of healthcare access uh, um, in, in terms of supply. Uh, but there's, there's you know, lots of statistical efforts that have been done to try to figure out what would be the appropriate number. And you, know, you get estimates like, oh, look, you're at 50% fewer clinics than you really need. You need a uh, 10% uh, uh, you know, increase in the public hospitals, things like that. And even, by the way, when you do do this, and you do, I mean, if you don't have a, a facility in every village, uh, you know, in the United States, you might say, okay, it's okay. You know, I, I live in, uh, in Lincolnwood. It's a suburb of Chicago. Uh, I, there's no hospital in Lincolnwood, but I go to school. Not a big deal. In India, this is much more difficult because transportation barriers are a big deal. So, you know, uh, uh, the next... Uh, village over uh, or the, the next village or town with a hospital might be 10 kilometers away, uh, but it's dirt roads and you don't have a car. That's a much more significant hurdle, particularly when there's a uh, need for emergent care. So large transportation barriers are an important component of the challenge. Um, but it's not just a supply problem, you know? It's not just that in, in lots of places you don't have healthcare facilities, it's that even when you have healthcare facilities, Sometimes you, if you're at the, you know, kind of the, the middle or bottom of the uh, income range, uh, you might not be able to afford it. And, and here's some pieces of evidence that suggest that that's an issue. Uh, the first one is just medical price inflation. So, you know, in the United States, we're so happy now relative to, say, the early 1980s, and we talk about how healthcare uh, cost growth has declined. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a debate that we recently had about whether or not the Affordable Care is responsible or not. I don't think it is responsible for it, but, but it's a secular decline I think we've seen uh, for a while. So we're getting reasonable rates, still above inflation, but something's just manageable. Contrast that with what's going on in India. Um, we don't have great data, but the little data we have uh, accumulated by a guy named Sumil Nagpal at the World Bank, it's just the medical price inflation may be 10% or higher per annum each year. Just a remarkable rate of inflation. 
uh, higher than the general inflation rate in India and suggests that there's a lot of price pressure. What does that mean? That means that even if there's a hospital in the town in which you're growing up uh, uh, or you're living, uh, and even if you can afford it right now, you might not be able to afford it in a few years just because price inflation is much higher than wage inflation. Does that make sense? Um, so it's not surprising you get this litany of concerns that fall out of that. Uh, which is, you know, the, the, again, if I were to pick one that for you to remember, uh, look at that last one. Uh, medical expenses are said to push about 60 million people uh, into poverty each year, uh, where, where, the, where we're talking about people going from APL, above poverty line, to below poverty line. Uh, but, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that contribute to this. One is India has very little health insurance, and the example of that, uh, or the kind of the, the indicator of that, is 75% of healthcare expenditures are out of pocket. They're not uh, financed by, by health insurance. And it, to, to put that in perspective, think about what the United States even before the Affordable Care Act. You have the exact opposite, right? So we be boned, oh my gosh, there are 47 million people without health insurance, things like that. But if you looked at out-of-pocket expenditures, it was still about 25% as opposed to 75%. So the situation in India is much more, and if you're a pro-insurance person, much more dire. Now you say, okay, maybe people can't uh, 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 get insurance, but surely they can borrow money uh, in order to, to go to the hospital if they need it. And that's very difficult too. Uh, credit markets uh, are incredibly poorly developed in India. Uh, and, and, and one simple reason for this is just uh, in order to provide credit to a village, you have to have somebody that can go into that village to figure out the credit worthiness of people. You have to build a branch, you have to know the community. But that's just cost prohibitive uh, in rural communities. And so what you end up getting is informal loan shop arrangements a lot of times. Uh, and the interest rates from that can range from, and by the way, again, putting this in perspective, in the US, you're, you're upset when you have to pay 18% on interest, right? <coughs> on credit card balances. In India, the loan shark rates rate from 60% to 120% per annum. So 18% sounds really good uh, for this group. So credit markets are not very well developed. Um, and so you see two things going on. You see uh, lots of people being pushed into poverty when they do pay for it. And a lot of times people say, hey, uh, I'm not going to get treated because the costs are too high. Fabrice. To what extent does the, this new uh, $1 billion, one billion people ID system, uh, and I'm not Yeah. Uh, well, he's no longer there, but yes. Okay. <laughs> will this uh, expand access to credit uh, through banks? Um, will, will sort of there be an IT system that allows this to be credit to be provided more cheaply yeah. than before? So Sanjay Bhargav, who's a person that uh, I got to know when I was first starting out the International Innovation Corps, he's one of the founding members of, the pay, of PayPal uh, with, uh, with Elon Musk. You know, he, this is kind of his hobby horse and has been for a decade. Um, and his big, he, he says the biggest obstacle is not can you have these cards or things like that. It's the problem is that you need to assess people's credit worthiness. So unless you can assess credit worthiness, you, nobody's going to be giving a loan, right? You need to know what's the repayment rate What's the repayment rate given the features like, are you in a family, do you have a job, uh, are you a farmer, things like that. Um, and you can't do that without having a local presence. And so the Aadhaar card, which is this universal ID, will allow somebody to borrow money to the extent people are willing to give money locally, but it doesn't, it doesn't accumulate information about the local risks uh, that an individual family is possessing, right? So, so there's a lot of interesting work on how do you address that, like can I look at uh, and this, I don't want to, this is better for Q&A, but there are some really innovative ways that people assess credit risk, even in this context. Uh, and it's not other, that's the really interesting thing, it's mobile phones. But we'll get to that if we want in Q&A. And I just had another yeah. question. Uh, to what extent is quality of care a huge problem, especially absenteeism? Like yeah. Mike and Kramer, Karthik, Mula Ridera, yeah. I said that name right. Um, they document this extensively at school, I think, in local clinics too. Even if we did expand supply, would people show up without proper intervention? Well, the absenteeism from whom, right? There's absenteeism from the students in schools and also from the teachers, which is a huge problem in Indian schools. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, in when you say absenteeism in schools, I don't think about the student, I think about the teacher, which right, is a big issue. Right, right. And, and when I think about that in the context of clinics, I think about the physician too. Right, right. Um, surely that's the case that when you increase supply, especially if it's government supply, they don't have a great way of ensuring that people actually show up and providing quality care. Um, that's an issue, but I don't think that's the, the most important issue that Indians face. And, and by the way, within that includes like people that here in the West we would call quacks, right? There are lots of quacks practicing medicine. In fact, there's a, a quack trade association, interestingly. They don't call themselves quacks, <laughs> but it's a big issue. 
uh, because these, some of these alternative medication systems or, or alternative medicine systems are not effective. Some are, some are. But I want to put that aside because I don't think that's the first order issue. I think the first order issue is you even go to a clinic to get, you even uh, get treatment done in a, hygiene, uh, in, a, in, a, in a hygienic setting, like childbirth. Uh, do you get some basic antibiotics when you have an infection that's curable by an antibiotic? Things like that. I mean, I think that's the first order effect. Uh, quality is a secondary issue. I don't think we should neglect it, but, but let's figure out you know, how we can get people into clinic uh, when it exists, something like that. Okay. So now, traditionally, so remember, I, I told you basically there's a, a, a supply side problem, not enough supply, but even when there's supply, there's two high prices, right? Accessibility issue, okay? Um, and traditionally, what India has done is focus on supply side solutions. So you know what they do? They, they build government hospitals. They pay for doctors, to people to get uh, medical training, get their MBBS is what they call it in India, the MD degree. Uh, and then they position these people in the government hospitals. And that's great, but, the, but it's not going to surprise you that, that in India we have two basic problems. One is the government can't keep up with demand. The economic growth means demand for medical services risen uh, or need for medical services risen, but the government just can't keep pace with that. And the second thing is, again, not surprising, is that the government's not necessarily the best manager of hospitals. Uh, you know, there are incentive problems within the government uh, uh, that can lead them not to be great at, at doing this. And, and, and in q and I'm happy to tell you a really interesting story uh, that involved the, the Jammu and Kashmir health secretary uh, was having a conversation with about the simple problem and his inability to see the simple reason, some very simple reasons for why he has issues with absenteeism among physicians at clinics. Um, but so they focused on supply side solutions traditionally, but in the last uh, decade uh, to 15 years, the government's been shifting to demand side intervention. So what that means is uh, subsidizing individuals to get treatment even if it's not at a government facility. And uh, what the idea is that now you make healthcare a little bit more affordable where it exists and also incentivize private supply of healthcare facilities, private clinics, private hospitals, things like that. And some examples of these are state schemes like Yeshafini by Kai Argeshi. I don't expect you to remember these names, but just there's some state schemes uh, there's some national schemes in the past called uh, uh, Danani Chiraksha Yojana, which is a, uh, uh, an incentive payment that people get to go get childbirth at an institution rather than in their home, a uh, more hygienic setting where we can also take care of the, the baby afterwards. Um, and then the biggest one is a program adopted in 2008 called Rastya Swasta Bhima Yojana, which I'll explain to you in more detail in just a second, but it's basically like Medicaid. It's the first Medicaid. So U.S. adopts Medicaid in 65, India really does it in 2008. Um, and it's going to, by the way, in a second, I'm going to point out how, in some sense, they put us to shame. Um, but the new moldy that government that's come came in uh, also has expressed an interest in expanding uh, coverage and providing universal coverage. Now we don't know how serious it is. There's talk, and they step back, and there's talk, and things like that. But right now, their current view is we're going to increase the size of the RSPY budget by one point uh, by 60 percent, uh, and then we're going to try to figure out uh, how to use that as a platform uh, for providing. Uh, healthcare to not just poor people, but non-poor people. And, and, and just put that in perspective, uh, non-poor in India does not mean wealthy. Uh, it means very poor by our standards, just not poor by their standards, uh, if that makes sense, all right? So I, I wanna be very careful. When I say above poverty line, I don't mean people that shouldn't you know, uh, uh, invoke sympathy or, or evoke sympathy in you. There are people that are, that are also uh, in need. Okay. So the platform that they were thinking about, that Modi was thinking about, uh, is RSVY. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but I, but I want to point out one thing. You know, we are, this study that I'm going to point out is, is really uh, uh, in a fort, is fortuitous. And, and the reason it's fortuitous, and here I'm going to give you a little side story on the history. So I had gone to India in 2000, so we were, you know, all health economists are actively debating the Affordable Care Act and, and the reform in Massachusetts just before that in 2009, 2010. And lawyers are thinking about, about this too, I happen to be a lawyer as well. And so we're thinking about how do you pass the ACA, was it passed appropriately, things like that. But I, you know, in 2010 it occurred to me, everybody is focused on the United States and there's a whole world out there other than the United States. Uh, and there are people that live out there. Uh, and so let's see what's going on elsewhere. And at that time somebody had asked me, why don't you come to India, study India's healthcare system. That's one out of every seven people on the planet. Uh, very little focus on this. Let's take a look. So I go arrive in India and I find out that India just passed uh, this m Medicaid program, uh, and um, uh, it's targeting uh, um, uh, basically the bottom uh, quartile of the population, people that are below the uh, poverty level. It's supposed to cover about 300 million people, 
Uh, and uh, they covered by this, you know, they'd almost covered by 2012, they covered 150 million people. Um, and so, um, the, the, you know, like somebody should be studying that. But I also thought, no, no, somebody should not only be studying that, but that's hard to do. Somebody should study about what comes next because they're already underway. And the question is, are they going to expand and get, provide basically Medicaid for all? So I go to the government. I go to the, the Ministry of Labor, which is actually writing this, and I say, hey, thinking there's no way they're going to say yes. You know, we should think about this. Every other nation that's had around, had, had down this path tends to go a little bit further and expand this. Would you let me do a randomized controlled trial where I randomize a large number of people into insurance, a large people not into insurance? And they said yes. <laughs> so that's fantastic. So I get to do this. And this was before Moody's coming in. So we're, you know, in 2012, 2013, we begin this project. Um, and it's not until uh, basically 15 that Modi takes this seriously uh, and talks about the expansion. Now, you know, that's great. Now we're actually going to be in the opposite situation where, where they want to move, they want to reform RSBY within the next year. And we're like, uh, can we just wait a little bit until the results start coming in, which they don't come in until this fall. But anyway, so that's, that's the background to, to what's going on and kind of an additional feature uh, that explains the study uh, in light of, of what the Modi administration is doing. But let me, let me turn back the, the attention back to RSBY. So RSBY, I said, is like Medicaid. Uh, so it's right now, I mean, India is a vast country. It's a federalist uh, uh, government, meaning uh, states really do all the work. The center just kind of sets priorities, maybe provides funds. The center does not have a lot of power. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it requires the states to do the implementation. We've got RSBY in over two thirds of districts, actually a larger number now. Um, uh, and, and you know, they started in 2008. By 2012, they'd already enrolled uh, 150 million lives. I just want to put that in perspective for a second. That's like half the U.S. population. I mean, you remember like uh, in 2014 when the ACA, uh, the, you know, uh, healthcare.gov goes online, we're like, oh, nobody's signing up. This is terrible. And we're so excited when you get 10 million people. They did 150 million people without computers. In, a, in rural villages in four years. It's amazing. And you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to complain about Indian hospitals. I like to do that. Uh, but this is an amazing accomplishment for the Indian government. So I think they deserve some kudos for this. Uh, and it's, it wouldn't be surprising to me if they're able to dramatically expand enrollment uh, if they decide to, to expand this program to not just cover below poverty line people, but the whole rest of the population, remaining 900 million, or at least a, a large chunk of those individuals. What is it that, that it covers? It's a very simple product. It's, it's, it's basically uh, you pay, you as the beneficiary for your household, you pay 30 rupees and then you get uh, coverage for hospital uh, treatment, inpatient treatment, uh, up to an annual cap of 30,000 rupees, okay, uh, per year. And that's 30,000 rupees for all the members of your household, which is limited to five, but that, that's a limit that's going to be expanded pretty soon. There's no deductible. There's no copay. Not because they don't think it's a good idea, but this is in the inside. You can't, it's very hard to implement these sorts of things, right? You have to track what it is that hospitals collect and make sure that the money's funneled back. That's too complicated. This is a cashless system, looks, works like a debit card. You have 30,000 rupees that can be used on healthcare treatments, inpatient healthcare treatments at hospitals. It works like a debit card. You go in, you swipe, your balance goes down, and then you use that over the course of the year, okay? Prices are set by the Indian government for what they're gonna pay for different treatments. Give you a sense of how big how much this covers? This is like, you know, two uh, cesarean sections and some change. Okay, in a given year. So this is meaningful from an Indian perspective. Um, and as I said, this is like Medicaid. Uh, the central government provide uh, provides cover. It's targeted to poor. The central government provides funding. It pays 75% uh, of all the costs, and the states administer it. Okay. So now here's some policy questions. You, you, you know, India's just passed Med, uh, uh, RSBY, this Medicaid-like program. You might ask, okay, number one, um, what's the benefit of the existing program, the existing Medicaid? It's like asking the United States, does Medicaid actually work? Does it improve access? Does it increase uh, healthcare utilization? Does it increase health? Um, now, one of the problems, though, is even though, and this is a big question, India, because um, even though RSBY has a ton of enrollment, 150 million plus, it has really low utilization, okay? In fact, you can, you can take a look at 150 million and say, why isn't 300 million? Same problem Medicaid has, why doesn't everybody take up Medicaid? But then second, even among the people that take it up, you've got very low utilization. 
And part of that is that people just don't know a hospital, like the value of hospitals maybe. Part of it is they don't know how health insurance works. Part of it is that the insurance companies are not incented to encourage claims. Uh, so maybe there's something going on with the insurance. Lots of potential reasons, but that's one issue. Let's just evaluate what, how RSQI is working now. A second question that you might ask yourself and the government asks itself is, well, what's the benefit of expanding RSQI eligibility? Going beyond this very, uh, this APL, this BPL population, below poverty line population to an APL population. Again, I want to remind you, APL does not mean wealthy. It just means not seriously poor, okay? Uh, uh, I mean, we look at the, 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 the bot, you know, I, I, I'm gonna make up the statistic, but it would not surprise me if the bottom 5% in the United States is functionally equivalent of APL in Indian society, right? Or at least median income in India. Extreme poverty in India is extreme poverty. It's just, it's a different class of poverty. Yeah? Can you help me to understand what 30 rupees, that cost of 30 rupees registration, how, how affordable is that? Okay, so, so the, uh, um, the best way to think about this, I think, is looking at somebody that is uh, at um, the border between APL and BPL. And the best way to think about the border between APL and BPL is to look at that annual, num annual cap of 30,000 rupees, and that would be the annual income of somebody that's right at the border, or close to the border. Does that make sense? So, and that's family income, that's household income. And I'm gonna, I'm shaking my hands a little bit just because India as a decentralized government has different po poverty line standards state by state that vary meaningfully and are measured in different ways uh, across the states. And so the, the most consistent way to do it is to use you know, either a World Bank definition or a, a federal uh, standard uh, in the middle. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say, something like that. Yeah, Now in the US, for people with income slightly above the Medicaid expansion uh, incomes, a lot of people do have here, probably very few. Yeah. So we would expect less crowd out for private insurance by expanding this exactly. scheme in exactly. given in the US. In fact, I have a separate project that I'm starting out, hopefully starting out with the Tata Trust, which is a foundation in India where what they've realized, and this is an issue also in the United States for say males that are unemployed uh, before the ACA expansion was, you know, there's a group of people that are below poverty line that have access to government insurance uh, or government access healthcare like Medicaid. Uh, and then there are people that get it through employers or their higher income, so they get it through the private market. There's this like the, the, the missing middle uh, that are not serviced by the private sector and not serviced by the government sector. That's who you want to go after. And, and so the Tata Trust realizes that and says, look, if we really want to have an impact on access, that's what we really need to target. Let the government stick with the very poor, let the existing companies stick with the very rich. We need to figure out how to create products for that middle. And this is very similar to the problem that existed in the United States until uh, the ACA. And then, you know, maybe to some extent still exists, depending on your view of the ACA. Okay, so the second issue is, uh, you know, what about impact of expanding RSBY eligibility? And, and even if you expand RSBY eligibility, you know, you don't want to subsidize everybody and give them free insurance, not merely because it might, that might not be just, but also the unique government doesn't have a ton of resources, right? So every dollar you spend, every rupee, sorry, you spend subsidizing an APL or, or you know, kind of top quartile individual is a rupee you're not spending on, you know, uh, helping farmers uh, adapt to drought or, uh, uh, you know, providing people with potable water, things like that. So there are real consequences of diverting those, those government rupees. What you want to do is you want to say, look, if I care about universal health care, I want to see how to get to universal health care at the least cost. And that means that if there's somebody in the, in, in the population that says, I'm willing to pay, you know, uh, 1,000 rupees for coverage, uh, but coverage costs 1,500 rupees, this person's not gonna get it, but I don't have to give them 1,500 rupees to get them to have care, I just need to give them 500. Because then I brought the price down to 1,000 rupees and then they're gonna get the care. And they provide the rest of the money. So what I wanna know is I wanna know what the demand curve for health insurance looks like and just give people just enough subsidies to get them to the point where uh, everyone is demanding universal health, uh, is demanding health insurance. Does that make sense? That's the kind of the, you know, whatever your view on whether or not we should have universal health care, conditional on wanting to have universal health care, that's the, the kind of the cost effective way to do it, okay? Which is really important to society like this. So that's the second issue that comes up when we talk about expanding RSQI eligibility. The next thing that's really important is, um, uh, the last kind of big question is, well, what should RSBY coverage? What should this Medicaid program cover? Uh, it covers hospital treatments to a large extent now, uh, but it doesn't cover, for example, uh, primary care, physician care. Like at a, at a clinic that's not a hospital, no, when, it's, when it's outpatient. It doesn't cover diagnostic tests. It doesn't cover medicines, okay? Uh, it doesn't cover what's called tertiary care, which is longer term stays in the hospital, okay? Uh, in, the, in, in Indian parlance. And so you might want to ask, well, what's the benefit of expanding coverage? Yeah? Do you know the status quo of the medical expenses in India? Like, what's the most expensive part? Like, class or uh, physician? Which is 
Well, hospitals, I mean, I mean, people complain about hospital coverage, but hospital coverage was an, an intelligent choice. It is the biggest shocks. It's, uh, in terms of total expenditure, I don't know if it's the largest expense. Like in the United States, I can tell you 40% of all money is spent on hospitals. Okay, and then I can also tell you, uh, you know, what the average price is coming out of hospitals. So I understand that hospital shocks are the ones that I want to insure. Uh, and the rest, you know, I, you know, there's a debate about whether or not you should offer uh, insurance coverage or provide people access to credit. Um, in India, hospital coverage is still going to be the most costly. I just don't know what, fra what percentage is the fraction of all expenditures. I'm going to guess significantly less than 40%. In part because supply is really low. In part because uh, prices are, are a little bit lower uh, than they are in the United States. Um, I don't know what the optimal level would be. Does that make sense? And once I know what the optimal level of care would be and what, what reasonable prices are in a competitive market, then I can tell you whether or not it's like the most important thing. But if I'm just thinking from an insurance perspective, what is the thing that's gonna drive somebody to poverty most likely to? It'd be the hospital shop. It's also, also the cheapest to insure from the government's perspective, the subsidized. Does that make sense? So I think, again, on a, without having tons of data, first order, if you wanted to start a Medicaid program and just cover one thing, you would want to cover hospital. Okay. I'm not even sure you'd want to cover tertiary care because it's so rare that people get it, right? Is it, so just like a little example of this, the premiums, so tertiary care programs cover really long-term stays in the hospital and they have larger annual caps of about 150,000 rupees rather than 30,000 rupees, but the premiums for those are actually lower than the premiums for RSBY, which covers more common hospitalization, shorter-term hospitalization, um, uh, and even for a lesser amount, and that's just because of frequency. Right? It's just so rare that people have to go in for tertiary care. So in terms of like the biggest risk of, uh, of pushing you into poverty, hospitals. But you might want to ask, you know, what else should I cover going forward? Right? I want to provide even more coverage over time. Maybe this is it. Okay. Yeah. Another policy issue would seem is the, the, the benefit of investments in public health, like clean water, sanitation systems, and everything on that versus investing in programs like that. Great. I agree completely. Um, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I can't answer the question whether or not on the margin one extra rupee, the next rupee always ought to be set on potable water versus hospitals. Um, uh, and there's two sides of this. There is what is the benefit to the consumer if I could, a beneficiary, if I could get that potable water. But the second thing is what can I achieve given a rupee expenditure. So, so the problem with potable water in India isn't a problem we don't know how to filter water. And, and to some extent, it's a problem because they're locally available water, but even that's not really the issue. The real issue is that even when we clean up the water and we build a pipe from, from the filtration plant or filtration source to you, somebody comes along in the middle and taps that pipe to get water for themselves, and the process contaminates the water. And so what India has a problem with is distribution. And unless it can secure distribution, you basically waste filtration. So I, again, in Q&A, I can tell you about a really nice program in Telangana to uh, provide not potable water, but tap water, uh, because they know that potable water is just really hard to do. Uh, and then the idea is to, to exceed people's expectations by occasionally providing filtered water so it's potable. But filtered water is a, a big challenge. But, but I, I think the general point they're making is exactly right. Um, I think it's actually a point about everything that we could do, right? Should we do ACA or should we have done uh, something like education for minorities in cities? I don't know. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I can't answer that bigger question. So I'm just gonna say, like, if we want to improve healthcare, what are we gonna do about it? What's the efficient way to do that? Um, subject to the view that if you can provide evidence to just that's not the right investment to make, I'm okay with that. Let's make another investment. Okay. So let's talk about what the Indian Health Insurance Experiment does. I want to answer that second question. What is the benefit and cost of expanding RSBY from BPL populations to BPL plus APL populations? What is the benefit of giving to APL populations? Um, and I, I also want to look at how much should the government subsidize insurance to just get people to buy it? So how do you get universal health care at the least cost? Another way to put this, I want the demand for insurance across the population. And of course, I also want to know the cost. Like how, how much is RSBY actually costing the government in terms of uh, health care utilization? Uh, and if I, can, if I can do all these things, then maybe I can do a kind of a cost benefit analysis to get it. Is this a good idea to expand it? Uh, or, 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 or at what price would it be a good idea? Something like that. Um, I also have an academic, that's a policy objective because that's what the Indian government really cares about, but I also have an academic objective. Um, so when we talk about Medicaid and we say that it's health insurance, no, we're kind of right, but we're not really. We're doing two things when we provide Medicaid in the United States. One is to give people in health insurance. The second is to give, pay people's premiums for health insurance, right? And we want to separate those two things out 
because those are two different policy levers that we have. And we sometimes use one, sometimes use the other. Take the Affordable Care Act, premium supports. Those are just the policy, this, this the, the, the premium subsidy, uh, uh, the, the kind of the paying the premiums level, right? It's not providing the insurance themselves because on insurance exchanges, you can buy private insurance, but the government's subsidizing that price, okay? In other situations, the government actually provides the health insurance. So uh, part of Medicaid is like this, but the parts of Medicare that you pay for, uh, like Part B, and we can have a debate about actually how much you pay for Part B, whether it's full, full whether it's subsidized or not, but, but Part B is supposed to be like the government provides insurance and you can buy it. Okay, so we can teach, it, and, and in the US we use both levers. We use them for different populations, for different purposes. We wanna measure the value of both of these things. I wanna be able to do that in this study as well. Because I wanna be able to advise the Indian government, hey, look, Indian government, you can't afford to provide universal coverage if you're paying everybody's premiums and uh, providing insurance. How about you just do this? Why don't you just provide an insurance policy that people can buy? And then we dramatically expand the number of people to buy health insurance. And the reason is because the private sector is not providing even insurance policies for sale in rural areas. Something like that, okay? All right, so what, do we, what is it roughly we're gonna do? We're gonna take about 11,000 households, that's about 55,000 people. So it's a pretty large experiment. So I, I think it's the, the second largest health insurance experiment ever done. Uh, we're gonna randomize them to get access to insurance with different levels of financial support for obtaining that insurance. And then we're gonna observe them for two years to see what the impact is on uh, healthcare utilization, health, and importantly, their finances, okay? So th this is pretty large scale. We're talking about 110,000 life years that we're studying uh, in this example. It's a collaborative project. You can't do something this large on your own. You know, once the person in the uh, MOLE, Anil Swaroop, had said, yes, you can do a randomized controlled trial, just find the right state, I had an immediate moment of, I didn't expect that answer, and I'm super panicked because I don't know how to pull this off. And what you need is you need a whole bunch of people involved in the government, you need a whole research team, you need to have uh, uh, good surveyors on the ground, and you know, this is not appropriate for Q&A, it's more appropriate for like a long period of time at a bar where you're buying me drinks. I can tell you about all the problems that arise when you try to do something this large. Okay. Yeah, you, you offering? I'm free tomorrow night, so. Yeah. Um, the Poverty Action Lab. Yeah. Yeah, the SKS one with uh, Rick Hornback. Uh, no, different one? Eric Appeal. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, but it didn't, that one didn't pan out. But have others uh, sort of, have other experiments taken place? Yeah, so the, the most famous, I think, is Rick Hornback with, uh, okay. so a friend of mine, uh, uh, Vic Akula, was the head of SKS Finance. Uh, and he, uh, which is a microfinance company, and what they had done is they had said, hey, look, uh, and they talked to Esther Duflo and Rick Hornbeck and Abhijit Banerjee, who are the, the kind of the, the latter two of the core of J-PAL, and then Rick Hornbeck's now at the GSB. You should get to know him, he's fantastic. Um, so uh, talk to Vika Kula and they say, okay, look, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, ran we're gonna, we're gonna do this randomization where uh, we give out uh, business loans, but for some subpopulation of our business loans, we're gonna randomly tell them they have to also buy health insurance in order to get the business loan. So you've got people that got the, health insur the, the business loan without health insurance and the business loan with health insurance. Two year project, you know, it's Esther and Abhijit and, and Rick, so it's like super high quality surveys. They've got this, this looks really good. It's supposed to be a two year project. Halfway through the year, SKS decides, as it turns out, when you make people buy health insurance, they don't want the business loan in the first place. And so people are dropping the business loan, we're losing business, so we're just gonna cancel the experiment and just <laughs> not require it anymore. And they didn't tell uh, Rick, uh, uh, Esther, and Abhijit. Uh, they found out. Afterwards, and so it totally screws everything up, right? Right in the middle of your study when people change around what the treatment is. And so they successfully managed to write some papers out of it, but that was kind of a fizzled thing. Right. Plus it had external validity issues because you don't care about what is the value of health insurance to people that have business loans because it's a small population that actually has business loans. What you care about is what is the, the value of health insurance. Yeah. One of the things that we really cared about is I wanted to look at something where there was a real good chance that this was gonna be the platform that was gonna be used for providing health insurance to a large swath of the population and then, so we have a little bit more external validity. Yeah. And so that, that's the idea. And, and by the way, external validity also means like, if I find no effect, it could be because, hey, health insurance doesn't have a lot of value, or it could be the government just did a bad job of implementing it. I think both are plausible, and so one of the things that we do, we spend a lot of time thinking about implementation, okay? Um, but, but there are uh, others. In India, this is the biggest one that exists. Uh, there are some observational stuff that have been done in the interim. Uh, the best paper is by a guy named Murad Sood, uh, and some co-authors, New York is at USC, 
Uh, and he's also the one that was on that, that World Bank uh, 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 article that I referenced in the first slide. Uh, but basically what they do is they compare, they don't look at this program, RSPY, they look at a tertiary care insurance scheme <laughs> and they look at the border of uh, 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 Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, uh, whereas one side has the tertiary care and the other one side didn't in certain districts and using that border identification, they look at the impact of tertiary care insurance on mortality and they find a positive effect. So it's border identification, but that's, you know, kind of, it's a surprising result, first of all, that you have such a big impact on mortality, uh, which seems maybe too large an effect would be my biggest concern, uh, but also generalizability is, a, is an issue. Um, okay, so, so here's the design of, of the field experiment and, and I'm not gonna present you results because results are gonna start coming in. We've done the baseline, we've done the enrollment, uh, 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 we're going to do our midline survey this summer on tablets uh, or uh, mini PCs and that those data will come in in September. So I'm going to tell you about the design and the goals and that's what uh, uh, um, would, you know, any kind of commentary on that would be helpful. So here's our sample. We look at a state that was willing to work with us, Karnataka. It was a state that had RSBY but hadn't provided universal coverage. Uh, it's a state that understood the value of the evaluation and that didn't shy away from the fact that we were evaluating the program that they were running. A lot of times governments are afraid of that because they're afraid you're gonna say something bad and they're, that's an issue. Karnataka wasn't afraid of that. They thought that they were gonna, you know, they were co confident in what they were doing, uh, but, uh, but they were open to this. Um, we also looked, it's one of the nice things about Karnataka is that it, it spans north, south quite a bit. It's like California, but imagine California in the Midwest, right? So what you get is you get, if California is in the Midwest, you get a good portion of the south and you get a good portion of the north. And so that's what we did. We picked the southernmost uh, district in the state and the northernmost district in the state. And we're getting basically evidence from uh, uh, deep South India, which is kind of strange to say because Deep South India is more progressive, uh, and then and then, then, and then kind of Central India in the Deccan Plains. Uh, the study uh, only enrolls people that are APL, but also people that are within 25 kilometers of a hospital. Why? Because if you enroll somebody that's far away from a hospital, what's the impact of health insurance? Zero. There's no place you can use it. There's no hospital. So I already know that's gonna happen. So what I wanna do is I wanna say, given that there's supply, I wanna see what the benefit of a demand subsidy is, which is providing you this uh, free health insurance. There are gonna be four arms of the study, which I'll explain in a second. We're gonna have randomized, it's a RCT, randomized controlled trial, gold standard of, of causal inference. I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, as I said, two years uh, is what we're gonna look at. And we're powered to detect 25% uh, change in hospitalization uh, uh, by year, okay? And this is really important. You ask, why is it that the study is so large? The study is so large because we've got to meet these power requirements and hospitalization is rare, okay? That's why you need to run a large study. Not just because I like running large studies. I don't like running <laughs> large studies. That's much harder. Yeah? How long was the enrollment period? Enrollment period for us was very quick. It was within three months. But, but for, the, for, the, for the state, it's similar sort of thing. Uh, it was about three to four months and we came on towards the tail end of that. But you know, the state is much larger than, than us. So <laughs> they had a much bigger challenge for them to do that much enrollment. We actually did it ourselves. We were given an enrollment kit and we were able to go to the village and try to, try to enroll people in the same way that the state did. Uh, we did a, one change, which I can tell you about in a second. So let me tell you, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip this slide because I've already told you about the sample definition. I wanna tell you about what the study arms look like and keep uh, a track of time. Can you find this? Okay, great. So the main, uh, so as I said, um, RSPY has two things. It's like Medicaid in the United States. It has two policy levers that it's pulling. One policy lever is it's providing insurance. The other policy lever is it's providing premium subsidies for the premiums for that insurance, right? It's basically paying those premiums. So I wanted to design a study that would get at the answer to what are the impacts of those two things, plus what is the, the, the benefit of different practical approaches the government could take to expanding RSPY. So I had one arm uh, that was basically where the population got free RSPY. It's like the way Medicaid is provided here, right? You get the insurance and you get a full subsidy. I don't even make uh, my population, which is APL, pay the 30 rupee registration fee. There's an interesting uh, reason why the government made uh, the, uh, the existing population, the BPL population pay 30 rupees. It has nothing to do uh, with the beneficiary population. It has to do with the fact that the people that are rolling out the insurance are independent contractors and they're really worried the independent contractors would just say they handed out cards when they never did. But if you make the people that are getting the cards pay 30 rupees to the independent contractors, the independent contractors now actually want to give the, the cards to the people that are supposed to get it because that's the only way to get 30 rupees. It was just a way to make the independent contractors actually do their job uh, in enrolling, okay? Uh, we didn't need that. Our study staff was actually doing the enrolling. I didn't need to incentivize them uh, and so I didn't make them pay it. Plus it actually creates its own problems if I suddenly start giving my staff an independent source of income, we start behaving differently. 
there's incentive problems even within my study organization. I saw a hand. Yeah, uh, there have been some studies in developing countries where when you make the, uh, yeah. decisions pay a bit, then they tend to use the project. Yep, and we're going to assess that too. Okay, great. Yeah, which is really good. So the perfect timing, go to the second arm. The <laughs> second arm, uh, actually, uh, Fabrice, I've actually given him a list of questions. <laughs> uh, and he's, he's really good. He's awesome. You should ask him when you present a paper because he'll ask him right at the right time. And, and uh, so, so, so thank you. So B, uh, uh, the second, second arm gets two things. It gets an unconditional cash transfer. You can spend it on whatever you want to. If you want to buy uh, agar bhattis, you want to buy some rice, you want to buy whatever you can. You can also buy health insurance. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to buy this government health insurance program at the price that the government pays for it. Okay? The third arm is going to get something similar, except it's not going to get the cash. It's just going to get the opportunity to buy health insurance, okay? The government health insurance at the price the government pays, okay? So really interesting question here is that some people are going to get insurance having paid for it, and some people are going to get insurance not having paid for it. And then you can compare the utilization of health insurance across those two groups to get at this issue of if you make people pay, are they more likely to use it? That's a really deep question in, in development economics because there's two theories that are out there. One theory is selection, right? The people that are willing to pay for it are the people that demand it more, and those are the people that are likely to use it more. And the people that don't pay for it don't demand it as much, so they don't like, like use it. It's just pure selection, right? Uh, so for example, uh, those of you that buy uh, tickets to uh, a play are much more likely to be the ones that value the play. The people that don't, don't value it. And if you just handed out free tickets, you're going to get less enrollment just because that's selection, right? That's the basic idea. Another theory is, hey, if you charge somebody for something, uh, they use that information, the price charge, to infer what the value of that product is. So if you hand out bed nets for free, people think, oh, this is not that valuable. I'm handing out for free. How good could it be? But if you make them pay, you know, one dollar for it, then they say, maybe this actually is useful. Otherwise, you know, like why would they charge? And so it tells you something about the value of the product, and so then you utilize it because you, you've changed your, your, your knowledge, your understanding of what the value of the product is. So we'll be able to assess these sorts of things uh, because we also include a willingness to pay module uh, in our analysis, so we can get at this issue directly. So we have that, that's uh, arm C, is just you get the option to buy arm C, why? Arm D, the last one, is, is no intervention arm. It's the control arm, yeah. How do they know that they have the option to buy it? Because we tell them. Oh, you, you give them a form or something? Yeah, we come to them actually a week ahead of time and we say, Hey, I'm going to be here in a week, either to, if you're in group A, to enroll you in insurance for free. If you're in group B, I'm going to give you cash in a week of this amount, and you can then buy insurance. Actually, we gave them the cash up front a week earlier, and then we came, said we're going to come back in seven days, and you can buy insurance. In group C, we said we're going to come back in a week, and you can buy insurance. Here's the time we're going to come, and we'll come by your house. In group D, we said nothing. Of course, until we approve that, they didn't know that they were in this study. They do, yeah. Everybody gets uh, pro uh, informed consent. They do the baseline even before they know what their treatment is. They're told that there's these four options. Um, it's just that when we do enrollment, one week before we do enrollment, we randomize people to the different groups, and then we tell them one week before exactly what they're in. Does that make sense? So everybody knows. Yeah. Um, so this is randomized across individuals? I'm going to talk about randomization and just yes. Yeah, so the, the reason I ask is if it's for across individuals, uh, I'm a little confused by option C because it has, it's randomized, but there's selection because someone could have the option and choose not to. And choose not to. Exactly. But that's what I want. Because I care about not I care about two things. I care about if I give you the opportunity to buy, mm -hmm. would you actually buy? That's an outcome. And then given that you buy, mm -hmm. how much do you utilize? Mm -hmm. And then what is the impact on health? And then what is the impact on your farm? But then given that I buy, there is a selection. For sure, but I like that selection. I want to measure that selection. I understand that you want to measure the selection that's within groups. Yeah. But then when you got group C, which has got a selection yeah. in it. And you're comparing that with group A or group B. Yeah. There's like randomized, but there's selection. Well, okay, so let's compare B and C. What's the difference between B and C? This is good. I mean, I, I'm sorry to use Socratic method, but you're getting at the exact same yeah, yeah. issue. So what is the difference when you compare B and C? What changes? Yeah, B and C, I can uh, see that they can be compared uh, because uh, there is an option except for the cash transfer, right? And what is the difference between A and C? Uh, no, 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 the cash transfer is good, right? Yeah. The cash transfer. So, so in some sense, you want to do something like this. If you compare A and B, yeah. the, the cash amount that they get is the same, except that one is you're making them buy, you're only allowing them yeah. to use it for one thing, yeah. right? So you see the incremental effect of that conditioning mm -hmm. on enrollment, mm -hmm. and then you can figure out what the impact is subsequently, yeah. right? On, okay. And then when you compare, so, so what I want to do is I want to just, so these are the sorts of 
if you just care about policy interventions, this is very easy. But if you're looking to identify those two parameters, which is the effect of insurance versus the effect of premium subsidy, things get a little bit more complicated, but you can do that as well. Okay, so I, I understand this is about enrollment rather than the outcome. Both. Because okay. it's a composite outcome, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and the thing to think about is, is in this context, you, it's very, so the question is, do you want to identify each incremental margin? Mm -hmm. To do that is very complicated. You need a ton of different arms. But if you're looking at a composite effect, right, which is really what the government cares about, in some sense when we're talking about two different interventions, it might be that some, even the economists would care about mm -hmm. uh, what the selection effect is, then it's fine. So the way that I think about this is, you know, when you think about unsubsidized versus, so this is just going to be policy comparisons. But if you compare, for example, uh, do I want to, you know, this is the same thing, do I want Medicaid for all? I compare, um, uh, sorry, if I want Medicaid for all, I would compare A versus B, right? That subsidized RSPY versus no intervention. If I care about, for example, just a public option, which is part of the debate in America, but you could introduce in India, it's C minus B, okay? If I care about, for example, should I just offer the option to buy or should I su partially subsidize it, you can either do A versus C, uh, or depending on how you're going to subsidize it, if you're just going to do an unconditional transfer, you can do B minus C, right? And one of the nice things about this uh, is um, this gets a, a nice, so, so there's a different view out there. So there's an organization, I think it's called Give Directly. It's one of these GiveWell charities that's favored by GiveWell, where they just say, instead of handing out benefits, we're going to hand out cash. Well, you know, if you care about a budget neutral policy comparison where it's hand out cash uh, or hand out money, you, you care about that. Um, Right? So I think that that's what you get at. And then I care about the composite outcome. Com composite outcome, yeah. Are you actually randomizing by individual or by family? Households. I'll get to that in the next slide. That's a fun part, especially if you're into statistics a little bit. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Um, why did you decide to come back a week later for um, Sabai? And how often were, and, and were you always going to their home? Or were you meeting them elsewhere? How often did you actually meet them twice? We went to their home. Uh, and the reason, so uh, we thought about whether or not we should randomize, so we had this debate. If you come back too soon, they might not have enough time to think about it. If you come back too late, they might have forgotten about the decision. So there's no right answer. And we thought, well, it would be really nice is to vary. And the reality is we ultimately varied because you can't come back exactly seven days later because they might not be at home. So we've got is probably a range of somewhere between uh, coming back uh, five days after to come back 14 days after. And we usually target like the next week, which gives you a range. Like if I come today and I say next week and I come next Friday, it's a little bit more than seven days. Mm -hmm. So what we have is just kind of somewhat orthogonal variation on that because we didn't control people's ability to get out to the field again. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to see if, that, if to, within a range whether the time between the first visit and the second visit affects their enrollment decision. Mm -hmm. But we can measure that, but, but we just chose one week because we didn't have a strong prior view on how long you should give them. We just knew that there were two types of arguments. And, and again, this is through talking to, to people that had engaged in uh, rollouts of government programs. Yeah. And across groups, were all study visits incentivized? All study visits incentivized. Like surveys. We had a participation incentive for all surveys, mm -hmm. which is you got 50 rupees per hour for the household. Mm -hmm. So that, that's basically it. And, and uh, we initially paid with coins, but then we switched because coins have their own set of problems, uh, to, like gold coins. Uh, not gold coins, silver coins. Uh, to mobile minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing now. Okay, so let me talk. I, I don't want to um, uh, spend too much time. This is my favorite part. So my background is econometrics. Then I came to health economics after that. Uh, so, but I really love this. So, so one of the big problems with health insurance uh, is that there are spillovers from health insurance. So imagine you're in a village and uh, you know what happens before you uh, go give health insurance. People might have informal insurance arrangements where our families decide to insure each other. They might have informal credit markets where they borrow money from each other, right? Then you come in and you provide formal insurance. One of the things you're gonna do is you're gonna displace either informal insurance or informal borrowing. But that means for the people that are not part of the program, you're gonna change what it is their option set is, okay? Uh, you're gonna change the interest rates they pay or the access they have to a you know, number of people that are in their informal insurance pool. That has a spillover effect. And so if you go into a village and you put some people in group A and put some group into group uh, D, the A group might have an impact on D. So how do, you, how do you measure that, right? Because you want to separate those two things out. One way to do that is to vary the fraction of a village that is put into A versus D. Now we have some global fractions. We want to put about 40% of the people in group A, 20% in B, 20% in C, 20% in D. But I can achieve that aggregate allocation by, but, but by still varying the within village allocations. And so that's what we do. We have a two-stage randomization. First, we randomize different villages 
to uh, different fractions of allocation to A, B, C, D groups. And then uh, with, once I decide within a village what, what fraction should go to A, B, C, and D, then I do uh, randomization within. And each time I engage in a matching exercise. And what the nice thing about that is that instead of just like randomly allocating people together, you know, across it, I say, okay, you two look the same. I'm gonna put one of you in treatment, one of you in control. You two look the same and do the things like that. That way the comparisons are a little bit tighter. Does that make sense? So we do matching and then uh, randomization uh, based on those matching. So we've got this two-stage thing going on, and, and there's some interesting questions about that because this is not very often, uh, often used, and, and, and you know, it's interesting how to do some statistics around that. Uh, and then we, we get to do a lot of interesting things. And one of the nice things about studies like this is that you find like a dozen additional papers to do. As it turns out, uh, we, we, so Indian villages uh, are organized into panchayats. So there are a bunch of different villages. They have something called a panchayat that's like a circle drawn around it where governance occurs at the panchayat level. So things are really complicated, kind of like 54th Street and 54th Avenue right up here is that it's a little confusing because village names can be similar. Or other times it's not clear where one village ends and another village starts. And so we had some people that reported the wrong village. And we tried to randomize within village, right, our, our matching. So we got like measurement error and matching. So we can look at the impact of measurement error on matching, on efficiency really interesting stuff that comes along a long way. So this is like, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, right? I find a problem, oh, that's another paper. <laughs> okay, yeah. Within villages, did you separate at all the, the areas even within the villages? No. So, so a next door neighbor could have yeah. a group in. Yeah, because okay. we didn't have good enough GPS location data. Mm -hmm. and, and addresses within villages aren't like addresses. Sure. I, I just, you know, you can go like, 1757 Hermitage to 2153 Hermitage to 20, you know, 1759 Hermitage. It just okay. doesn't make sense. Or more likely, it's like the one that's right across from the, the primary school to the one that's diagonally across from the primary school. Right, so it's a little complicated. And I think I answered your question. We're randomizing households. Okay. All right, we have two basic instruments. We're going to either survey the entire population in what's called an annual survey. We do that at baseline and we do that at midline. So a baseline occurs before enrollment. It occurred about 18 months before enrollment. Uh, and then uh, midline, which occurs about one year to 18 months after. Uh, it's actually 14 months after is when it's going to occur. Uh, and then we have a second type of survey that's not surveying everybody, but it's surveying uh, certain types of people. So one of the problems with uh, this sort of survey is, you know, hospital insurance is only a problem if you're sick, right? It's only a value if you're sick. But a lot of people aren't sick. So you have this huge population, and about only 20% of them are sick during the course of a year. And only that 20% are really going to think about whether or not to go to the hospital and think about whether or not to use insurance. So when you survey the entire population, you're kind of wasting 80% of your surveys on people that are not even close to thinking about hospitalization, right? Which ex post, insurance have no value, and you can assign it a value of zero right away. So how do we solve that problem? So we designed this new type of survey uh, and that's another paper that we're, we're writing, which is basically what we do is we call people every two months, households, every two months we ask, uh, was there a major sickness in your household? And there are different ways that we measure that. And then if you answer yes on the phone, then we send a survey team out to you to do an in-person survey. So we're focusing on that 20%. Does that make sense? So we don't have to survey the 80%, but we have to call everybody every two months. And that's what we do, basically. And the other nice benefit of this is instead of doing a one-year recall, which is what an annual survey does, says, have you had a sickness in the last year? Have you been hospitalized in the last year? You might think, oh, of course, who doesn't remember this? But as it turns out, we know that there's serious recall problems. But in this new type of survey, we, again, this was driven by budget. We have a two-month recall. Uh, we could have gone shorter even, but two-month recall. So I'd only ask you in the last eight weeks or our last two months, have you had a sickness? Have you been hospitalized? And we think the recall error is going to be much lower. And in fact, you'll see that we overlap when we do the annual survey and when we do the, uh, the, the what we call a post-health event survey, so we can see the relative recall rates uh, that are going on. So we can see how much extra you capture with, uh, with the shorter recall period. Uh, yeah? What percent of your survey population had access to a phone? Uh, actually, about 85% of access to a phone. 60%, th here's the challenge, though. So we do two things. First is we ask them if they've got a phone, and then we ask the neighbor. Because if I can't reach them, then I can reach the neighbor. And that's true whether or not the household has a phone or not has a phone. Uh, mobile phone penetration is remarkable in India. The big problem is that people recycled their SIM cards. So they stop paying for a while, toss out the SIM, they get a new SIM, it's a new number. So that's our biggest challenge. Um, so what we do is we 
when we did our pilot, we found out that basically, we, although we had numbers for 85%, only 60% actually had a SIM that was valid from when we originally got the data. So what we did is then we said, okay, for the rest, we're gonna call the neighbors to see uh, how many we could get. And we can get maybe like a quarter of the remainder, but we still have a big gap. And so what we end up doing is we go to households uh, when we do the annual survey and get more information. And, and we've also trained, uh, so for example, if you're on the PHES team, uh, they're gonna be, maybe you're going to a village because somebody said that they, on the phone that they have a hospitalization, but we know that there are these two households that, that never responded to their phone and we couldn't get their neighbors to contact them. We just go to that household and at the same time administer both the phone survey, but do it in person and the follow up. It's kind of, this is logistics from a study perspective, right? You've got to figure out these sorts of solutions. Um, okay. So now let's think about the sort of, of outcomes that we measure. The most important outcome is healthcare and finances. Um, and the way that I think about this, and, and this helps you see the difference between the United States and India. So there, there, there are two types of people in the world before you provide health insurance. There's the type of person that says, I got sick, uh, but um, I, I, the cost of care was too much so I didn't get it. And then there's the type of person that says, I got sick, I didn't have insurance, but it was worth it for me to get care, so I paid, but I had to pay out of pocket. And maybe that's bad for some reason, okay? So there's those two types of people. Now, if you look at that first group that didn't get the care, when you provide them health insurance, what is the big change you see? You see that they go from not getting care to getting care, okay? Not that a big improvement in their finances because they didn't spend money on health care at all. For the second type of people, those are people that would have gotten care either way. So you don't expect an increase in utilization. What you expect is a change in how they finance the health care. They went from paying out of pocket to paying with insurance, okay? And the, and the benefit of that depends on how much out of pocket, I mean, how much did it cost to borrow money? basically, okay? Uh, or what did they have to sell to, to finance this? And so you want to think about insurance in that same way. In the United States, we did this study. We, not me, but it was done. It's the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment where they looked at the expansion of Medicaid and they said, okay, uh, what is the impact on healthcare utilization? What is the impact on healthcare outcomes? Uh, and also, you know, you can go back to the Rand Health Insurance Experiment that was done in the late 70s, early 80s, and it's largely consistent. And the main thing that Rand finds is uh, yes, there is some increase in utilization, but there's no increase in health. Meaning there's nobody that, it seems like for the most part, unless you're very, very poor, um, it's not the case that you don't get the treatment that you need. It's that you do, you just switch from whether you're paying for it out of pocket or whether you're paying for it uh, with health insurance. Okay, that's the main change in the United States. In India, it's a little bit different, right? We know that 25% of people said they didn't get care because it would cost too much. So we think that plus the fact that, that you know, this is a less developed country. It might be the case that there's a lot more uh, uh, people in the group with that without insurance wouldn't have gotten care and with insurance get care, right? Whereas in the United States, it's mainly populated by people that without insurance did get the necessary care and with insurance just got the care again, but this time didn't pay for it out of pocket, okay? It's a really simple way to think about what the benefit of insurance is and, and, and why it might differ from different countries. And so in the United States, we, so in India, we wanna think about those two groups. So we wanna first think about, you know, for whom is this actually increasing utilization? And then for whom is it not really changing utilization, but really changing how they pay for it? Um, and in the United States, by the way, what's, what's the typical interest rate that people, 18%, right? People are borrowing the credit card. Even the Medicaid populations are borrowing on their credit card. So what you're looking at is going from like 18% interest to whatever the cost of capital is under insurance might be zero under Medicaid. In India, you're looking at going from 60 to 120% interest rate down to zero. So you can imagine the financial benefits are much bigger, right? Not only are there bigger effects on the on utilization, but bigger effects on finances. So we look at both those sorts of things. Does that make sense? It's a really simple way to think about health insurance and, and what impacts it's gonna have. In the United States, you know, you should be fairly convinced that it's mostly a financial gain, less of a health gain. Um, but in developing countries, I think that there's a fair argument to be made that it's it's a bigger health gain, yeah. I guess my question is if you you're you know, here you're comparing the US to India and you're saying that you're seeing improved, but if we look at countries in the north not just in quality, but the presence of a health system doesn't mean that health gaps exist. So even when you take away that financial component, I think this goes back to the question earlier, is that you'll still, for example, in Europe, or even countries like Tanzania, you'll still find that there's a sizable gap. In so quality. In, well, no, there's a sizable gap between the health status of different populations. And that's often because of other things, such as whether or not they're getting you know, care that addresses their needs, Oh, I, I, I don't, I don't mean.
mean to say that, no, no, I, I, I want to be very clear about this. The only reason I use US as an example is because we're sitting in the US and I'm assuming that everybody here knows something about how uh, uh, Medicaid works. One of the reasons I didn't pick a third world comparison, so I could have picked Kenya, uh, I think that would have been a good example. Um, uh, but the only reason is because then I gotta explain to you how the K Kenyan healthcare system works. So that's the only reason for the comparison was of, of convenience. I think the important thing about what you're saying is um, two things. One is that there's, you know, even if you give people access to care, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good quality care. I agree with that. Um, I disagree on the sense that I think that, that Indians have a problem just getting access in the first place. So quality is a second order issue. I'd love to get to the point where quality is the main concern. Um, uh, the second thing I think is important to think about, and I don't know if you intended this, but when you think about a government healthcare system versus what we're talking about here is that there's two changes going on. One is, are you getting access to care for free versus who is actually providing that care? So one of the really interesting things here when I think about quality is the difference between public hospitals and private hospitals. And so a very common issue in, in India is that public hospitals, especially large hospitals, are really low quality. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't know in every country whether that's the case. I, I actually think it's not. But in, in India, I think there's a, a good argument to be made that they've got a lot of work to do on improving the quality of government hospitals. Um, I think that's worth investigating, and I think it varies across countries. I don't mean to neglect it. I just don't study it. Here. But when you think about health insurance, and I'm not doing an intervention that changes the quality of supply, this is the, these are the two margins that I'm thinking about. Does that make sense? So I, I, I'm not going to answer everything. I'm just going to answer two narrower questions. I actually think that B and C would be more likely to engage in moral hazard because they've selected it to, uh, they had to pay for it either with the unconditional cash transfer or their own. So they're more likely to be selected based upon their, their value of the insurance. And there's this nice paper by Amy Finkel's team that shows that people selected an insurance on the basis of the anticipated moral hazard they have. The more moral hazard you're gonna have, the more likely you are to select in to an insurance plan. It's just another form of adverse selection. Uh, but there's possibility of moral hazard for sure. And the Indian government is concerned about moral hazard the difficulty we have, and I'd like to measure it at some point, the, and I can measure it on one angle, which I'll point out uh, in a second, but I can't do it in the usual way that we do in the United States. In the United States, what we do is we vary the copay and then check to see how demand varies. So that's how the RAND health insurance experiment functionally works. In India, it's not possible to collect copay. There's just not the administrative capacity to do that. Uh, um, and so we don't, we don't, we don't, we can't, that's like a, an infeasible policy lever. Um, one thing we can do, and I'm trying to work with a different organization to do this is, Moral hazard uh, can be affected not only by the price of medical care, but by the price of financing the medical care. And so if you can change, for example, the interest rate that you pay on loans to get access to medical care, then you're basically changing the price of medical care, in which case you can see what the demand curve looks like, mm -hmm. and then you can back out the moral hazard as you change copays. So that's just, that's, yeah. We don't know yet. We don't know that. Don't because know. that would kind of go to a yeah. <coughs> That's right. right? Uh, it, it, um, in the sense that if a lot of B and C is overrepresented in the 20%. Well, that would tell you that whether you got the insurance affected the incidence of sickness. Yeah, so, I, so someone said that I am sick and people so, in B and C are yeah. like, I am sick and because I have paid for the health insurance. So if you look at the first two months say afterwards, right? I mean, if you think it's because you didn't get care early on, so you can tell two stories. One story is the guys that got insurance got treatment earlier, so later on when you call them, they're less likely to report being sick. Another possibility is uh, it's not that because hospitalization is rare and utilization is rarely rare. What's really going on is for some reason, uh, people that get into A and are told that they're in A are more likely to report that they're sick. Okay, that's possible too. We'll be able to check them that. Uh, I, I want to apologize. I'm going to go a little bit faster to get towards the end, uh, just because so we don't get bogged down. So we look at obviously healthcare and finances. We're also going to look at health behaviors. Uh, so for example, one theory is this consistent with moral hazard is, hey, if I'm insured uh, for lung cancer, then I'm going to smoke a lot because you know there's no cost to me of doing that, or the cost is much lower, right? Because the healthcare costs have, in some sense have fallen. Uh, another approach is actually a fatalism theory, which is look, my life was a disaster to begin with. I didn't think I was gonna survive, so who cares? It's like, you know, I'm on death row, I might as well smoke, no big deal. But suddenly you take that person off death row and they're like, okay, now I care about smoking. It's the elimination of fatalism effect. 
I don't know which is the right effect, but we take a look at health care, health risk, uh, uh, risky healthy behaviors to, to uh, assess which of those two effects, if either, is going on. We also do an interesting component uh, looking at cognitive capacity. So there's this theory uh, um, that's mainly promulgated by three people, two of whom are Sendhil Mullenathan and uh, Anuj Shah, who's over here as a, he's a psychologist in the, in, at Boot. Um, and their basic theory is, look, when you, it, in, it's particularly in developing countries, but it doesn't have to be. When you suffer an economic shock, that causes a reduction in your cognitive capacity. And, and you know, usual, typically hypothesized mechanism is that it causes stress, and stress causes lower cognitive capacity. And then you start making other bad decisions because your cognitive capacity is impaired. So for example, you know, you lost your job, you start making bad decisions about whether or not to send your kid to school or about, you know, what type of housing you get and things like that, okay? And, and, and this might be a pathway toward, might be a, a, a mechanism for a poverty trap, okay, where one thing can have a snowball effect. One of the things that we wondered was, wait a second, first of all, does that happen with healthcare shocks? Meaning like you, you, you get sick and I got to pay medical care. Medical care is, the cost of medical care is like an economic shock, like a financial shock. It could cause the, the sort of reduction of cognitive capacity leads you to make other bad decisions. That's one possibility. Or it could be, look, any kind of shock. It doesn't have to be an economic shock or financial shock that causes reduced cognitive capacity, even a health shock, right? So you have uh, childbirth uh, or you have uh, you know, a stomach ailment uh, uh, or you have surgery uh, for a workplace injury. That just can cause cognitive, that can cause the, the sort of maybe stress that reduces your cognitive capacity and again leads you to you know, spill on effects on other economic decisions. So we're gonna check for this. At baseline, we do a bunch of cognitive tests that are standard battery that they use in these sorts of studies, and then we do follow up. I'm gonna push, I'm gonna put you oh, off because I, I wanna get to the other stuff, and then we'll take questions. Otherwise, we're not gonna get done. But I will get back to your question. Another really interesting question, again, look, the idea that you should get here is that you don't get to often randomize at such a large level on something that's externally valid, and when you do, write every paper, answer every possible question you can with that. And so that's our approach. Uh, so here's another one that we're doing. Um, so it is in, healthy, in, 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 in development economics, we've known for some time that if you provide cash transfers to a household, because of bargaining power imbalances maybe within the household, uh, um, the cash transfer tends to favor male consumption as opposed to the female or child consumption, okay? And the question is, well, what if we, instead of giving out cash, which is super fungible, we give out an in-kind benefit, and it's an in-kind benefit where we have some sense that women tend to know how to use it better meaning they have more knowledge about the healthcare needs of the subpopulation and you know, it's, you can't take, like a, the, the male head of household can't take the health insurance and go to the bar and say like, hey, can I have a, a beer in return for a health insurance policy, right? So it's a little bit less fun, it's, it's directing consumption. So, that, so one view is, yeah, this should rebalance, maybe this disproportionately is gonna favor uh, women and children and that's great if we care about changing the distribution of consumption within the household. The alternative view uh, is to say, no, it won't do any of that. What'll happen is, uh, let's suppose the split was the men get you know, 90% of, of, of cash and consumption and, t and women and children get 10%. Now, if you provide health insurance, the man might say, well, I don't even need to give you the 10% because you've got health insurance, and I'm gonna take all 100%. So that's an open question of whether or not in-kind benefits can change the intra-household allocation of benefits, uh, intra-household allocation of consumption, so we'll be testing for that too. And so this is work that uh, Alessandra Voina in the economics department is going to be working on. Uh, another issue is willingness to pay. So we'll be uh, assessing people's willingness to pay for health insurance. Uh, we ask that in an unincented way, but you know, as an economist, I don't think that people may not give them an accurate answer. Uh, you know, like when I ask you, how much is that uh, uh, can of uh, soda worth to you or something like that. So we've devised methods uh, to uh, uh, get people to give the right answer. Uh, and I can tell you about the detail. The mechanism is a really interesting mechanism that, that simulates you're being in an auction where you have to bid enough to get the, the item, otherwise somebody else is gonna get it. And that gets you to, we know that that gets you to bid the right amount because otherwise you lose an opportunity to buy something you value. It's called the, uh, the Becker de Groot Marshak mechanism. So we do that and we compare the incentive mechanism to the unincentive mechanism. And we also use uh, the fact that we ask this only on a subpopulation because it's hard to do this. Uh, and the characteristics of that population to be able to extrapolate to the rest of our sample population. But the ultimate goal is to, I want to estimate a demand curve for, for health insurance, and I want to see how that demand curve shifts, A, over time, B, amongst people that get it, health care, uh, that, that get uh, sick, and C, among people that have insurance. Because those are all things that can influence your views on the value of health insurance, right? And I, what I want to do is be able to predict for the Indian government, here's what the demand curve looks like, here's an optimal you know, potential schedule for, for needs tested subsidies. Um, 
So we already talked about price and how if you charge people money, they might be more likely to value or more likely to, to utilize uh, health insurance. So we'll look at that as well. And so that, that's, the, that's not even all the things that we're doing, but those are the, the bigger things that we're doing. And, and again, different people on, on different teams are involved in these. This is a, generally our timeline. So we started in 2013 in June uh, where we did our listing. In 2013 to 2014, we did our baseline. Uh, we did, <coughs> excuse me, Last spring, we did our uh, treatment assignment. Uh, this summer, we'll do our midline annual survey. Uh, again, it's going to be on mini PC so that we'll be able to get our results hopefully by September, October, and begin doing, producing some papers on preliminary results. Uh, starting from July, all going all the way to next May or, or even June, we'll be doing this post health event survey. And so then that's like our second year evaluation. Uh, and then we may also do uh, another more wide, wide willingness to pay survey. Because uh, I think that's something that the government's going to want. And we're also thinking about introducing more biomarkers uh, into the survey. We do some anthropometric measures now, but one of the things that we'd like to do uh, is either do things like uh, hair cortisol to measure stress uh, as part of the willingness, to, uh, as part of the cognitive capacity uh, study that we're doing, uh, dried blood spots to just kind of be able to get a baseline of what is the distribution of disease in this population, uh, and also nutrition. So that's it. We are also going to be doing two other uh, projects. We're going to try to do a project where we expand coverage to include things like primary care and medicines. Uh, and I'm um, uh, talking with potential partners to do uh, uh, a study of health loans to figure out, you know, in India, a real big question is, if you want to provide people access, is the best way to provide them access to provide them health insurance, which is a complicated product as it turns out. It's not something they've seen before. Or is it just to give them subsidized loans? So that you, so they don't have to pay 60% or 120% interest. They just have to pay 24% or 18%. Sounds terrible from your perspective, but from a from an Indian villager, that's a huge improvement. Uh, and 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 that sort of accessibility not only does it address moral hazard, but it might be something much more feasible uh, for the Indian government to accomplish and something that people already understand. It's a big issue. All right, let me stop there, and then I can take more questions if people have time. Yeah. So let me answer the first question. The second one is just a general question of whenever you do surveys, people should do. So whatever the, you know, like we have, uh, we've had a negotiation about this with the IRB. Off the top of my head, I can't remember whether or not we tell people. Like we were mainly thinking about like you know, if you find really high blood pressure. Yeah, this are you, are you we tell them, but we, we have to be very careful because we can't provide treatment. Uh, and so there are limitations, right? Because if you go too far and you start providing recommendations, then you're liable for the bad things you say. So all you can do is say, hey, you're, you, maybe you're at risk. And it's a really, a really big problem for us because the problem is that that person then doesn't become useful for the study. Uh, because if you tell them they've got a problem that they did not think about before, then you've actually manipulated their demand curve, which is what you're not trying to do. Um, but on the first issue, the sustainability, I agree with this. Um, I, I don't think that the sustainability is an argument for why you ought not do the study, because it's better for the Indian government to know what the impact is rather than not know the impact and do whatever they're going to do. Uh, so even independent of sustainability, I think like the work that Jay Powell is doing is super important. Um, but for us, the way sustainability works is the following. In fact, the problem we have is the opposite of what you're suggesting. So I have a, this International Innovation Corps. We identify development projects. So, so what had happened was when I started this project, other government agencies or, or uh, officials came to me and said, can you help with how we implement ration cards, how we do Aadhaar, Nandan Elakrani. Uh, and I said, these are super cool projects. I cannot do all of them because I don't have the capacity to. But it occurred to me that um, I could recruit graduates of ours to go do these sorts of things and spend a year to do that. Uh, and that's just to provide, I mean, you might say like, oh, what could we possibly provide these guys? If you knew the type of staff they had versus what the, co what the capacity is of just our recent grads, you would realize this is a huge improvement. Uh, and so, and, and I can tell you the economics of why that is. And so we do that sort of thing. We've done lots of different projects in lots of areas, not just health. But in the coming year, uh, we think we're going to send a team uh, to Karnataka to help them with RSBY implementation and Arogeshi Vajpayee implementation. Uh, um, 
and also uh, send a team to the Central to work with uh, um, the Joint Secretary that's in charge of RSVY uh, and is in charge of doing the RSVY revamp over the coming year to think about how to structure RSVY and do implementation. And there we can import some of the, the results of the study into decision making they have. Only problem is there's an inconsistency, almost a time inconsistency between what the government wants to do and what, what our study says. So our study is going to give you results, earliest preliminary results this fall. Really full results next summer. But RSBY is going to be fully revamped by next March. So we have to provide answers before we get all the results in. And so we have to figure out what are we comfortable seeing. And the reality is um, medical, like, uh, medical journals and economics journals are not going to be happy with this. But at some point, you have, it's better to answer the question with some degree of confidence rather than 95% confidence. And so what we'll probably do is just say, like, we'll look at the literature and we'll look at what preliminary results we have and then we'll provide some advice on, you know, what is the benefit of expanding eligibility, for example, or, you know, here are the problems with implementation that you need to address. Um, so th in some sense, that's sustainability because what it does, it directly goes back into what the government's actually doing in terms of expansion. We already know what's going to happen. Thank you.